This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey, everyone. Are you in for a insightful, thought-provoking treat today? I had such a delightful conversation with Stacy Ruth. If you're not familiar with her, you will be. You need to go out and get her books that we mentioned in the episode. She is the founder of two seven-figure agencies. She's an acclaimed marketer, award-winning author, and she's been among the top 50 entrepreneurs in Atlanta and just many, many more accolades. But more importantly, she is such a tremendous, tremendous human being. And we had quite a robust conversation around our intuition, talked about levels of decision-making, our own humanity, imposter syndrome, the list goes on and on. I think you're going to feel like you're more normal, feel like, oh yeah, it's not just me and just great stuff. And so before I get into one little nugget that she shared, if you haven't yet subscribed, please make sure to head on over to Apple Podcasts or Podchaser and subscribe. And please make sure to write a review and rate the episode. It makes such a big difference. And if you do it on Podchaser and you want to leave a comment, I will respond and we can have an awesome little dialogue there. So when you get into this conversation, pay attention to the role gratitude plays. Think about when she talks about the four levels of decision-making and what level you're at and what is it going to take for you to get unstuck and move to what she calls level four. And One of the things that she said that I just love that I'll give you right now is she talked about when we are uncomfortable, it is really a tap on the shoulder that we're getting from our intuition for a growth opportunity. So I'm sitting with that. I'm hanging with that. I would love to hear what you get out of this conversation. All right, Stacey, I am super excited to be having this conversation. There's so much awesomeness in your work. So I want to, we could jump off in so many places, but I want to start here. So the purpose of the work that we do is all about rehumanizing workplaces. And the way we look at it is we talk about honoring the uniqueness of people so that they can show up as their best fully authentic selves. And you have a little spin on this in that you talk about the challenges of doing that, particularly when people fall into the category of being first only different and how that leads to imposter syndrome. So I would love it if you can expand on that and say more. I will tell you that we could talk all day about imposter syndrome for sure. And and I experienced it. It was first identified in the early 70s when women were coming into the workforce and were first only different in just about every category. I certainly experienced it even in the early to mid 90s myself in the agency world where the men were the buyers and the men were the sellers. And it's women in a man's world. Well, that was first only different. But we know now it's not just women. It's any first only different. It can be people of color. It can be transgender. It can be any kind of I'm the only person I see and identify with in this business organizational culture. And what happens is we get this message, I'm different, therefore I'm not enough. Therefore, somehow I'm a fraud. Therefore, somehow I am being disloyal to the groups that I do identify with. And that's where we start to feel like imposters. It's really a diversity and inclusion issue. And so many of us have it. And there are so many ways that it can manifest from trying to be Wonder Woman or Superman or being a perfectionist. There's so many ways that we can do that. Yeah, it's really a coping mechanism, right? That whole, like, if I'm not enough or I'm, I don't belong or I'm not accepted. And it's interesting because I was literally literally just having this conversation with my son shortly before we had this. And we love Dr. Seuss and we have a bathroom that's Dr. Seuss. And I'm like, one of my favorite quotes from him is why fit in when you were born to stand out. And at the same time, you know, that's okay, fine, being your authentic self. Like my favorite color is sparkle. And I finally embraced that later in life where I was like, oh, you tried to fit in earlier, whatever. I mean, that's a goofy example. But the point being is when you're first only different, I can totally see that because I coach so many 
people. And on one hand, they want to feel like they belong. But yeah, it's like, am I betraying my group? I have a niece who is a person of color. And when she was growing up, her friends who were also of color told her that, well, she really wasn't, she was an Oreo. They were like, well, you're just a white person in a black person's body, Mm -hmm. right? Or other things. And so it's so interesting when we think about like, let's have representation. Like we finally have our first woman of color, Supreme Court justice, first black Supreme Court justice. But it's like, yay, there's finally representation and she's going to face her own challenges. Or so it's like someone has to go first, but there's a lot of responsibility, but burden that goes on that. So how does that as human beings, like we want to, it's like this dichotomy. We want to be seen for our uniqueness and be able to be accepted and belong for our authentic self. And there's challenges that go with that. Like, do we really belong? Or how do we know if we belong if we're the only one or or the group that we're like, they feel like we're betraying them. So how does all of this tie into us listening to our own voice and our intuition? Like, what role does that play in all of this? Oh my gosh, yeah. The idea of imposter syndrome The imposter syndrome itself is believing external messages that I'm a fraud, right? We have ways of coping with it, but it's listening to the outer messages, not the inner messages. So no matter how much we've achieved, no matter how much we've accomplished, and it does belong to the really high achievers, Maya Angelou, Michelle Obama. Sheryl Sandberg, Albert Einstein, you know, all of these individuals expressed imposter syndrome, right? They also, interestingly enough, are people who really lean into intuition. And that's how I got through my case of imposter syndrome. And Oprah talks about it. Albert Einstein, oh my gosh, he talks about intuition and really trusting that inner spark, that inner wisdom and that insight that it's not woo-woo. A lot of people think it's woo. It's not woo. Our intuition exists in our whole brain. And of course, 90, 95% of our thinking is unconscious. That's where a lot of our intuition exists. It's always thinking, it's always processing, and it's always identifying what will really light us up, who we really are, where we need to go to lean into what we want. All of these kinds of things are what moves us into achieving roles. And then the messages from outside of us can knock us off our center. The best way to come back to our center is to really learn how to use, leverage, recognize, act on the intuitive guidance that we're always receiving. We just don't always realize that that's what's going on. I love that. And it reminds me of a quote that Brene Brown has said many times, that is, it is human nature to care what other people think. But when we're defined by it, we lose our capacity to lead. Bingo. Yeah. And I would add to that, that when we're defined by it, we lose our capacity to just be effective and show up. Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to poke you a little bit because I love to like just go to a place, but you talk about your own journey. Would you share a little bit about your own journey with imposter syndrome and kind of how you found your way to your own inner voice and intuition? Because I think there'd be value in that. Absolutely. So my story, actually, I realized what was going on with me and I was kind of relieved and I was inspired that I was reading something from Ariana Huffington about her story and realized that she and I have very similar stories. And of course, she's a high achieving Greek entrepreneur. So she definitely falls in that first only different category. But when I started my first business, I believe we were about 10 years into it. It had been doubling in size every year. We had had such high turnover during that time that we, one year, we replaced a third of our staff. And that's part of the impact when a leader has imposter syndrome is that it's contagious and you have a lot of upheaval and overwhelm and stress and perfectionism, all the things that individuals with imposter syndrome do to themselves, they do to their teams as well. But I found myself on the bathroom floor in our office. I was 
not yet 40 years old. I had been having headaches 24 seven and I was losing my hair. And now I had just found out I was bleeding internally. And that is the dangerous physical toll that classic, and I'm classic, I've got like four of the five personas of imposter syndrome. That's what it will do to your body. It's not just in your head. You find yourself pushing so hard because you don't want to be found out as a fraud and a failure. That And you're winning all kinds of awards. I was the top 50 entrepreneurs in Atlanta under 50. I was twice one of the top 100 it agencies in the country. It wasn't like I wasn't succeeding, but the price was too high. That was the experience that I had. So thank you so much, first of all, for sharing that. And as I'm listening to you, one, I resonate with that so much. It's, it's not even funny. But I think about so many people that I coach. And again, you're right. It happens a lot with high achievers because keep pushing yourself because you're trying to prove something, whether it's prove somebody wrong from childhood who said you weren't good enough or prove to yourself you're good enough, or there's something we're trying to prove that we're holding on from childhood point blank. And when we think that our, we're not enough as we are, yeah. that we have to somehow prove that we're enough, that we have to prove we fit in. When we attach our value and self-worth to our achievements and what we produce and what we get done, then that's just going to naturally lead to more and more versus, yeah, that stuff's great. And you know what? That's not what people value. When I leave this earth, people aren't going to go, oh gosh, she got so many awards, right? They're going to value me for how it, but that gets all messed up in our brain. So I just, I so appreciate that. And, you know, it was interesting because as you were talking about being first, only different, I was thinking about in my journey and I never really thought about it as imposter syndrome. It was just not enoughness, but they're kind of one and the same. I mean, they, they can go together, but I do recall like in my, <laughs> in my PhD program, there were so many times that I was like, I don't belong here because I came from a kinesiology public health background. And here I'm in this PhD program for organization and management. And I'm with VPs of HR from Boeing and these major companies and the military, and they all have MBAs and undergrads in business. And they took that traditional path. And I remember distinctly sitting there at one point in time, halfway through my program. And I said, what the hell am I doing? I'm this fitness public health chick. I don't belong here. Like, I remember what God love. I don't remember which professor it was. And they're like, no, we need you here because you see things differently and you connect dots that these people don't. But I was like, I don't belong. And so thank God someone told me I did because I almost dropped out of the program. So anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to really articulate because a lot of people aren't sure if they have imposter syndrome or not. I wasn't sure. The clarity for me is in the definition of imposter syndrome. It's not self-doubt. We all have self-doubt. I don't know if I can be a first-time parent. I don't know if this is the right relationship for me. We all have self-doubt. I don't know if I can live up to expectations for this job and role that I've just been promoted into. Totally normal. That doesn't mean you're an imposter. What does mean you're an imposter is someone congratulates you for your achievements and you dismiss it because you don't believe you earned it. In other words, someone says, congratulations on being one of the top 50 entrepreneurs in Atlanta under 50. And I say, well, it's just that I knew the right people. I was just in the right place at the right time. So rather than owning what we have achieved, we believe that it is not earned, that we don't deserve it. And therefore we are a fraud and we will be found out and they'll kick us to the curb. That's where imposter syndrome really gets us. It's deeper than, I think most of us at some level struggle with that not enoughness. Like you, I got a message from my math professor who was from Poland. So we're talking about kind of a patriarchal society. I was one of, I think there were five women in the mathematic program that I was in, probability and statistics. And it was one of the senior level classes. And he told two of us, Women don't belong in the math department. We get those messages. Not just you don't belong here, you don't deserve to be. That's where the imposter syndrome comes in. Yeah, I so appreciate your clarification with that definition. And I think 
what I see in the clients I work with who have some degree of this is I don't deserve it. And also the, I'm going to be found out. And so then it's that vicious cycle that you said, like led you to get physically sick. And in my case, on more than one occasion, it's led to various physical ailments as well. Cause our body has a way, if we don't slow down, it's going to say, all right, you, I'm done. Like I'm going <laughs> to shut you down. Right. Right. And it's been this. And so with myself and my clients who have this included, it's the, well, because I don't think I deserve it because I'm afraid of being found out. I'm just going to keep working harder and harder and harder to somehow think that at some point I'm going to think I belong, or I'm going to think I deserve it, or I'm going to, but the problem is until you reconcile that crap, that's it, that you never get there. That's it. It's like being on one of those gerbil wheels. And so it's like, you have to do the inner work to shift that narrative, because if you think that you can just keep pushing yourself and that narrative is going to go away. They're super successful externally and off-center internally. That was my experience of it. And the intuition doesn't need anything to prove it's deserving and worthy. It just is inherently deserving and worthy of any and all of it. I love that. So here's what's interesting. I think this is a really great transition. So you think about the past two and a half plus years that just seems like we're in this bad, like the Groundhog Day movie just keeps going over and over. But every time you turn on, there's another mass shooting. And then there's another on top of COVID. Now we have monkeypox and we got the war in Ukraine and we've got women's rights that have been taken away. And it's just, it's just like a bad movie. Like it's just one thing after another, right? And there's so many difficult challenges that are going on. And what I've learned is that when we're faced with that, it's so easy for us to revert back to old habits, revert back to old thinking that isn't effective, that doesn't serve us well, but helps us feel safe. But you talk about in your first book, which is own your own shift. So everybody go get that one. You talk about these common universal things that we go through during difficult transformation. And I think it's so relevant because this has again, been one difficult transformation after another for such a long period, kind of what are you seeing right. that people could use to help them through this that you talk about in that book? One of the things that I really talk about is leaning into your discomfort. So if I'm uncomfortable, I had some discomfort as I just described, but if I'm uncomfortable, that is my growth edge. That is my tap on the shoulder, if you will, from my intuition that something needs to change. and. Many of us, maybe most of us, maybe all of us, like to avoid being uncomfortable. And we talk about getting out of our comfort zone, but when it really comes down to it, we're not really interested. We want the quick, easy, immediate hit. And I believe that's part of what's gotten us into this situation is looking for the quick, immediate fix. So I invite people to lean into the process to not just look at the goal. Oh, high achievers, we want our goals, right? To not just look into the goal, but to look into the process itself, because that's where the real growth happens. It's not achieving the goal, because each goal is just a step towards another goal. And if we're living for the goal, if we're living for when we retire, if we're living for when we have a million dollars, if we're living for when we start our next business, rather than in this moment, we're going to miss the whole experience. And the other thing that especially imposters struggle with, we all could use more of it, is celebrating with gratitude every step along the way. To stop and celebrate each day what we have achieved, accomplished, created, lived through, even if it's not what we would have preferred to have lived through. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I love that. On so many levels, there's a few things that I want to circle back to because I think it's really common, really universal, and really impactful. One, I do think there's a difference. There is a very common saying that growth doesn't happen inside your comfort zone, and that's true. But you're right, people who are high achievers, I think there's different levels of growth. And I love the work of Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy out of Harvard, and they just talk about, and even David Rock with the Neuro Leadership Institute. When we look at what happens in our brain, right, biologically and psychologically, it's that when we like hit stress, it's really a developmental plateau. And that we have to have those moments of discomfort to grow, right? It's not just, oh, like, I'm gonna run an extra mile or whatever. Like, it's literally 
when it scares the crap out of you and you have that visceral reaction, like you want to throw up in a garbage can, like that's the level of discomfort. We call it waiting in the messy middle, right? It's not. And so I think there's a different of like, this isn't going to be the right analogy, but like physical discomfort versus that mental and emotional. And I think when we're going to get through some of that deep inner work of getting through imposter syndrome and being able to listen to our intuition and being able to leverage more of that growth mindset versus that fixed mindset, we have to let ourselves be emotionally uncomfortable and know that, hey, this is part of part of that process. And I love, I would love to get your thoughts as we were talking about, yeah, we need to celebrate the wins. And one of the things that I've done for myself and with my clients is actually I get it off the wins because they will make a laundry list sometimes a mile long of, oh, I did this, 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 but they don't really take it in. And I'm like, forget it because you're still focused on accomplishments. I will say from a gratitude practice, what qualities about myself am I grateful for today? Not what did I get done, but what qualities about myself and then what missteps or detours or squiggles or setbacks am I grateful for that brought me learning? Because they'll just like, yep, I got that done. Yep. Check my list, check my list, check my list. I'm like, so what does that say about you as a person? Well, it's where we're taught to live is up here on the surface in the accomplishments. One of the things that I learned to do as I was overcoming imposter syndrome. And I also spent some time doing a lot of spiritual work. I became a metaphysical minister during my digging out of imposter syndrome. One of the things that I do in the mornings is besides getting whatever junk I need to get out of my head with journaling, is I also set intentions for the day, not of what I will check off my to-do list, but how I will be, what kind of connection I will create with myself or others, that sort of energy. And then at the end of the day, I reflect on it. And that is a different kind of accomplishment for me. And I think that's what you're talking about. I think a lot of us would be a lot better off if we just were more intentional about how we show up and exactly and setting intention at the start of the day. But honestly, sometimes throughout the day, because right, if things are going haywire or life is doing what it does to be able to go, okay, I need to like set some new intentions because I'm noticing that I'm getting frazzled or I notice that I'm getting hijacked or we use permission slips. What do I want to give myself permission to do, feel or let go of in this moment or in this meeting or in this experiment? Like, yes. right? like post-it notes, permission slips. <laughs> Here you go. So I love it. So people setting intention at the beginning of the day, leaning into some of that discomfort, Is there anything else when you think about helping people through difficult transitions that would be important for them to consider too? You don't need to do it alone. We've been through the isolation. We're still trying to figure out how much isolation is good and how much is not good. And I don't believe that we have settled on that as a society right now. And there's different kinds of together while we're at it. What I do encourage people to do is whatever transition you're going through and what might be a difficult transition for you might be a no-brainer for me and vice versa. But whatever the one is that's your unique challenge, I do tell folks, if it's a unique challenge for you, it's really on your soul's purpose to deal with it. And there are others who are going through it too. There is no one who has come up with the only situation where you're dealing with whatever, fill in the blank and find your tribe. And I'm saying, find your tribe where you've got some people who are a little bit ahead of you. Some people are a little bit behind you. Y'all can go together and find a guide. And that's what I think a lot of people are doing. I think it's why the coaching industry is exploding. They're looking for guides who have had similar experiences. I love that. Actually, one of our rehumanizing principles is find your tribe. And we look at it as seek out diverse relationships to impact change. But it's the same premise in that we're not meant to go this alone. This is not a solo journey. And so as soon as we're in that mindset of, well, I have to figure it out, or I'm by myself, or I'm the only one, that you're probably not. It's just finding that community to support you and help you through it. I love that. I tell folks, your pain is not unique. Your story has its own uniqueness, but your pain itself is not unique. And you need to find others who are going through the same thing. I love that. I love that. So this brings us, I think all of this has been leading into your latest book, which you have, which is called Inside Out Smart. And you talk about decision-making ability. And I think everything we've been talking about, from my perspective, really feeds into that. Because I feel like if we aren't listening to our intuition, and if we're showing up with imposter syndrome, 
and we're showing up exhausted. I know I don't make good decisions when I'm in that space, but how does everything we've been talking about feed into our decision-making ability? And what are some ways we can make better decisions? The idea that many leaders, many innovators, engineers, scientists, technology, healthcare, all of these fields where we're really trying to lead innovation, there is this kind of pervasive idea that we can run innovative ideas, creative ideas through a gauntlet of what's already been done in order to validate whether they work or not. So we're looking at facts that already exist, that have already been proven in order to pretest our innovative thinking. And I propose it doesn't work that way, <laughs> that true innovation is disruptive and you can't measure what has never been done by what's been done in the past. I know Steve Jobs was a huge proponent of that. He never did product testing. And others like Dyson, Red Bull, you know, some of these innovative products, they did the testing, but they didn't listen to it. And thank goodness, because they created these innovative approaches. I help people break through a lot of the biases that they think are fact-based. This is the way we've always done it. Status quo bias, or I call them the deadly eight, and help them recognize them, help them recognize their assumptions, test their assumptions, but really bring forward the intuitive leap. And I do it the way that they taught kids to use intuition back in the late 70s using riddles. There were studies that were done on these kids that actually taught them how to tap their intuition, and then they tracked them into adulthood. And in this test that they were doing, they found that when the kids understood how to solve problems using their intuition, they were better, faster, and more accurate in their solutions. But they also developed essentially a lot of the qualities of emotional intelligence. So they had better relationships. They achieved higher and didn't have imposter syndrome. They were more productive. A lot of these kinds of impacts of actually using our intuition, they were more creative and innovative as well. So what they did and provide a riddle when I talk to people about this, I'll give you the riddle. You want to play? I do. Of course I do. Yes. So here's the riddle. And by the way, here's the thing that I want you to embrace about riddles. There's not always a single right answer, which is another fallacy that we get into. There has to be, it's a dark and stormy night. You're driving your little sports coupe to Cedar, but it's pouring rain. And you pull up to a stoplight and there's a bus stop beside you. At the bus stop, you see three people. You see the partner of your dreams. You see the friend, the dear friend who saved your life once. And you see an elderly lady who looks like she probably is at death's door. You can only put one person in the passenger seat of your car. Who do you put in the car? I put the elderly woman in the car and I take the person who saved my life into the driver's seat and I get out. And stay with your partner, right? <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. We could have some hot moments in the rain and I'm just saying a little lady gets saved and my life-saving friend gets dry. I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> Absolutely. And here's the thing. In that solution that you came up with, there are a ton of assumptions that we're making. Yep. Yep. Right? We're assuming that your friend who saved your life can drive, right? True. We're assuming that the bus will come eventually. <laughs> All of these kinds of assumptions that we're making, the riddles help bring forward what we're not always using as conscious decision criteria, but they're always present. And they also, and that one didn't particularly, but they also play into our biases as well and bring that into our consciousness too. Because those are the things that can really interrupt our intuitive thinking and problem solving. Well, unless you're watching a superhero movie, which apparently there's only one answer to the riddle, or you don't get to where you're going to go in safety. But I, I digress. <laughs> but we digress. We digress. 
So what's one of the other things that we should be thinking about? I know that you got eight of them you talked about, but what's one of the other things when we think about making better decisions? Because I really do think people are struggling. I mean, they are struggling like with major decisions in their life or in their workplace. But they're also struggling with minor ones because there's so much change and so much choice and so many factors. And there's almost a, I've experienced, there's almost like a paralysis of, oh, I don't want to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing or upset the wrong person. The reality is you're going to do something that's going to piss somebody off, but you got to make the best decision with what the time. And again, with your intentions and recognizing we all have bias. And lately I've been coaching a lot of people who are really struggling with decisions. And like, I used to be clear and now I'm second guessing myself or they're getting 360 feedback that says you're not decisive enough or it's not clear. So what are some things people can do who are struggling right now with decision-making? There are four levels of decision-making. The first one is just kind of automatic. We're on autopilot. We're brushing our teeth. We're making that cup of coffee. We're driving to and from work. We can just like blank out. Like I know. I was conscious, but I don't remember getting from point A to point B, that sort of thing. That's level one, decision-making. Level two decision-making is also called black and white thinking, this or that, right or wrong. It can work sometimes. Do I get out of the way of the moving car or not? There's a survival quality to the binary decision-making. The third level, though, is where a lot of these folks get stuck. Present company included have gotten stuck here. And that level three thinking is where the search engines really come into play, where we are looking at all the possible solutions that are available to us. And that's where we get analysis paralysis. And we're researching the facts. We're looking for the externals. But at a certain point, it's not enough. And it also can get us bogged down and stuck. So what I encourage people to do is to move into level four thinking, where, which I call creating alternatives. You can research to a certain point, but at that point, you then have to set it aside and check in with your intuition because there will always be the unknown. And if we've learned anything in these last two years and more, we've learned there is no certainty. There is no right answer. There is no one answer. And even if we think we know how things are going to turn out, we don't. So that's why creating alternatives is such a powerful tool that allows us to stay in possibility instead of going to probability. I think that's so important, to, like possibility versus probability. And as you were sharing that, I think people want a level of certainty that doesn't exist in this world. <laughs> They're searching for something that doesn't exist. It never did. No, that's the thing. It's like, it was like this before. It's just been amplified because guess what? There's more social media and news reports or whatever, but this stuff has been going on to one degree or another. It's just, we have more ways to find out about it. And so, yeah, it, people are acting like this is something new, but newsflash, it's not, right? And the other thing that comes up is that what I love about how you put the different levels is I think when we're stuck in level three, Would it be fair to say that we're out searching for everything? And this might get back to like innovation, like the work that we do, we actually call the community that we've trained our paradigm pioneers because there isn't stuff out there. And so early on in our business, people would say, well, where's the research and the data that this approach works? I'm like, well, we're working on it, but we know that we have 30 years of data that says what we've been doing doesn't work. So you want to keep doing what we know for fact doesn't work? here's what we're pulling from, which is why we're approaching it the way we are. So we're not doing this like without any kind of knowledgeable or informed foundation. But yeah, we are kind of figuring some of this stuff out and going with what we know and then tweaking. And for some people like, yeah, that makes sense. And other people are like, nope, but I'm going to wait for 15 years until you've got 30 published articles in peer review journals. And then I might look differently. And you're like, okay, well, have fun. <laughs> you know, see ya. <laughs> The whole idea about where are the facts to support it, I mean, New Coke is a beautiful example of we had all of the (laughs) perfect facts to back it up and it flopped madly. And I have my theories with my probability and statistics and survey and research building background about why, I don't know, I wasn't there. 
but I can see at least eight different possibilities just with biases alone that could have screwed that up. And all the facts seem to line up. And that's where I think we get too caught up in the facts rather than in a knowing without knowing how we know and trusting in that, which is a greater sense of knowledge that's in our 95% of our brain, not just that little 5%. It's funny because I was having a conversation with my husband, but he's got this amazing intuition. And when he has like a, we call it his little little spidey sense. When he has a spidey sense about, he does (laughs) like about something or a situation or a person, he has yet to be wrong. And like, he's like, I'm telling you this person is bad news. I'm like, no, I'm like, turns out they are. I'm telling you there's something off and, you know, turns out later it is. And the times when he doesn't listen to it, like, oh my gosh. And I think about myself, like, I feel like I have a pretty good intuition, but what I've learned is when I don't listen to it, one, it's like, it's there, but I, I'm so busy or so distracted that I'm not paying attention to it. So I don't know it's there. Or the second could be that it's there, but I don't want to listen to it or it's too scary. And the third might just be because if I am stuck in what I call human doing mode rather than human being, I have no opportunity to even listen to that voice with them, which is why I think having some sort of reflective practice, whether it's in the morning setting intentions, whether it's the end of the day reflecting, whether people meditate or journal, but you look at, speaking of facts, but you look at the research out there and it's consistent over and over and over that the most effective people and the most effective leaders spend four to five hours per week in deliberate learning and reflection. And that can be reading and reflecting, that can be journaling, that can be coaching, whatever, but we're working on ourselves and creating space to reflect and they reflect each day. It might be 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And I think we can't get to level four decision-making and thinking if we're so jam-packed that we're not creating space for ourselves to reflect and be. And for some people, it's really vulnerable and scary to do that. Well, it is. And anything that we haven't done before can have that sense of scariness of newness, right? It's like, just like being a first-time parent. It's like, what if I screw up? In the book, Inside Out Smart, I give people tools to build the muscle of their intuition and connecting with their intuition. And you hit on journaling, it teach them free writing, dream journaling. And I encourage them to not get too empirical about the interpretations of their dreams, that it's really more about what it means to them although we, what it means to me as a Westerner might mean something different to an Easterner because our cultures are different and the symbology is different. But within our dreams, there's symbology that has meaning to us. And that's all we're looking for. What does it mean to you, right? Mindfulness practices, meditation, rituals is another fabulous way because it brings us into the present moment and the listening to intuition. And like with the imposter syndrome, I'd really like to anchor The definition of intuition is simply knowing without knowing how you know. And the idea behind that, and this confuses people, there's no emotion in it. We talk about that feeling, right? But intuition itself is not emotion. It's a sense, but it's not an emotion. Our ego then takes it and runs away with it, either excited or afraid. That's our personality at play. And I don't want to villainize our ego. It's our personality. But that's the dynamic that people can't differentiate between the intuition and the ego. And when I say, oh, ego's got emotion, intuition doesn't, that, oh, now I can recognize it. It's like when you say to someone, well, how do you know? I don't know. I just know. I just know. It's like... And that's okay. <laughs> so we could talk about this for hours, but I, I want to turn it back to you a little bit for your own humanist one. And I've been so appreciative of you sharing your journey. And you talked a little bit about how you were experiencing when you hit imposter syndrome. And one of the things besides that being super common for people, one of the things that I've learned in the work that I do, that it is very common for us as humans, whether it shows up as imposter syndrome or something else, but we all have stories whether we realize them or not, whether we're in tune to them or not, but we all have stories that we tell ourselves that are self-limiting, that keep us safe and small. And some of us have done the work to try to move beyond them, but even so, they still show up from time to time and it's human and it's normal. So what I would love if you would share is, even with all the work that you've done, 
what is the self-limiting story that you still tell yourself sometimes? And when it shows up, how do you move beyond it so you can still show up as a leader and maximize your positive impact? The story that I still tell myself is one of the earliest stories that I told myself. And that I'm very specific about it's a story I told myself. I'm not convinced that I was told it by someone. I made up my story about what was going on around me as a young child. And that story was I don't matter. My feelings don't matter. My desires don't matter. I don't matter. And so, of course, part of my way of dealing with that is to be out in the public eye, to be writing books, to be speaking on stages, to be on podcasts, all of these things. Every time I do it, I have to focus my energy to say, I only need to be speaking to the one person who needs to hear what it is I have to say. That's the only person that matters. And to give love to those individuals who need the love. When I teach people about speaking professionally, I teach them to give the energy they want to receive from the audience. I love that. It reminds me, you know, we're not for everybody, but if there's one person, I mean, the same way when I do this podcast, if there's one person that gets a nugget or when I write a blog or teach a workshop, if there's one person who walks away with something that they can use that helps them or that validates something they're going through or normalizes something, then you know what? Great. And if it doesn't resonate, that's fine because none of us are for everybody. Absolutely. Well, your audience isn't everybody. (laughs) It just isn't. And yet we want to belong so badly to everyone. But we need to belong to ourselves, right? We have to belong to ourselves before we can belong to anybody else. That's right. That's right. That's that giving love. Absolutely. Okay. Stacey, are you ready for the quick questions? Oh, Yeah, let's do that. All right, fun. Okay, fill in the blank. Living authentically is? Being in the moment of what's on my heart. Love that. When the world is presenting an opening, but you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? (laughs) You mean before or after I have the chocolate? (laughs) Hey, chocolate is good. (laughs) (laughs) I spend time in reflection, and I do a lot of this on social media, but I try to share the insights that I have in that situation because it anchors it for me. And ultimately, if someone's looking for a leader and I'm not feeling like showing up, that's about me, not about the world. And so if I do the work on myself and I share it again, it's that one person who needs to hear it. That's awesome. What's something people would be surprised to know about you? They might be surprised if they haven't read my books to know that I have a a little bit of a daredevil streak. I've done a fire walk. I've jumped out of an airplane. I love adventure and I will will try anything once. Holy moly. All right. (laughs) We'll call you Stacey Knievel. I like it. Okay. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite go-to movie? (laughs) I'm probably going to show my age here, but, well, I've got two. My sick day movie is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. (gasps) Yes! Oh, my God, love it. And the one that I just terrifyingly know every line from is Princess Bride. Stop rhyming, I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that means what you think it means. (laughs) That's fantastic. Okay. I love those. I I can appreciate that. (laughs) What's your go-to song? Oh, my goodness. I really love and probably could listen to all the time any Beatles song. And the one that I absolutely love is not Beatles. It's the Eurythmics. Sweet Dreams. Such a good song. It's just a power song for me. I don't know. Every time it comes on, I visualize the red hair, the suit, the video, like, yes. Yep. Yep. Good. What's something you can't live without? Well, we mentioned chocolate, but I'll add coffee. Good. What's something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy? Oh, my fur babies. They are absolutely delightful. I've got 
two cats and a dog and their hands and they just love to cuddle and it's just nonstop fun. Fur babies are great. Fur babies are great. And last but not least, what are you grateful for right now? I am really grateful to be doing the work that I really love and get satisfaction from and the chance to really work with people who are on the same journey that I've been on. And it's just reassuring, it's reaffirming, and it's very empowering, not just for them, for me too. I love that. That's fantastic. I can feel your passion and I know everyone you serve benefits. So one last question. If you could challenge leaders everywhere to practice this one behavior that would create more human workplaces and equip everyone to show up as a leader, what would that be? Curiosity. We spend too much time trying to have all the answers, to know all the answers. And I think as leaders, many individuals feel like they've got to have it all together. And to be able to ask the powerful questions, not just of the team, but of ourselves, I think is the path to transformation for our world. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com and of course, hit that follow button. 